Well, welcome to you all. I'm very, very pleased that you could come in and join us uh, tonight. Uh, you, as you may know, uh, one week from today, on the 12th of March, will be the 10th anniversary when uh, perhaps the sexiest enlargement round of NATO has taken place because, you know, after 1949, there had been a couple of rounds of enlargement when uh, the t Turkey, Greece, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, and then later Spain joined. But in 1999, three former communist countries became members of NATO. Who would have thought? Ten years before, in uh, 89 or the beginning of 90, a politician in Hungary by the name of Jula Horn, who later became the prime minister, broached, first broached the idea of Hungary joining NATO. And you can't imagine the public consternation, the outcry. You know, we, 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 we still haven't left the Warsaw Pact. In fact, there were Russian troops in Hungary. And here was a politician talking about joining NATO. And 10 years later, it became a fact. I uh, will turn this over to our moderator, Jim Tapp of uh, Grumman Northrop. He is very, very gracious to accept this role, and he will introduce the panelists. I just want to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, one very special person, actually a very special couple, Ambassador Donald Blinken and Vera Blinken. And please, if you could rise, and I would like to, uh, for, uh, for all to recognize you. Ambassador Blinken. <laughs> was the U.S. ambassador in Hungary, to Hungary, between uh, 1994 and 1998. And although the actual accession did, uh, happened after they have left, they uh, both were very instrumental in seeing Hungary join uh, this very, very special organization. Uh, ambassador Plinken uh, um, was involved not only in the technical talks, but he, he visited Romania. He had, he had a lot, a lot of uh, background work that he did. And he writes, they write about this in their new book, Vera and the Ambassador, that has just come out. And it describes this period beautifully. So I recommend uh, this to you if you want to do some, some reading into the, 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 the sort of the ki uh, kitchen secrets of how it all happened. Anyways, uh, I just want to thank you for coming. I'm very grateful to, to hear the, the pains, the joys, and uh, perhaps a little bit of the future of uh, NATO with these three countries as members. So please welcome uh, Jim Tapp, our moderator for tonight, who will introduce the speakers. And I understand that uh, the speakers will have about 10 to 12 to 13 minutes of introductory remarks and uh, hopefully a discussion between them. And of course, the floor will be open to your questions later on. And once this formal part of the evening is over, I would like to invite you in the next room for a little Hungarian buffet. Thank you very much. Jim? <clears throat> well, I'll be very brief here. My, uh, my job is to try to keep this on, uh, on track. I understand we have, uh, we're trying to turn, end around 6, uh, 6 p.m. this evening, and uh, each of our speakers will speak for about uh, 10 and a half, 12 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit more, you know, politicians and whatever. <laughs> um, and at the end, uh, hopefully we'll have some time for, uh, for some questions and some, uh, some dialogue and discussion with our, with our speakers. Our first speaker will be uh, Professor Charles Gotti of Johns Hopkins University. Charles. Our second speaker will be Ambassador Topic, who is the permanent representative of the Republic of Poland to the United States. <clears throat> and our third speaker will be uh, Ambassador uh, Paulus of uh, the permanent representative of the Czech Republic to, to the uh, United Nations. So you didn't come to hear me, so let's start with uh, Dr. Gotti. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very nice to be here on a panel with uh, two old friends, uh, Professor Paulus, as I knew him, and who played such an important role in the, uh, in the Czech uh, opposition movement of the 1980s, and Ambassador Topic, uh, uh, who, who did so much for, for NATO uh, enlargement. Also in the audience are my friends, if I may say so, Vera and Donald Blinken. I see back there Professor Vermesh, uh, and and I have uh, ma ma mainly my wife's uh, friend uh, Al Ross. So I Ross here. So 
I think I, I better be careful because uh, she's going to get a report of how I do here, and uh, uh, I don't need that kind of uh, <laughs> trouble at all. Some of you may remember a book written by one of the great secretaries of state, Dean Acheson, uh, called Present at the Creation. Not, not only is it, was it beautifully written, uh, but an important book about the post-World War II situation when the United States <laughs> decided to return after uh, ending World War II and trying to come home uh, and uh, soon enough had to discover that there was a dangerous world out there and then came the Marshall Plan and then came in 1949 the foundation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Uh, I do believe that the second uh, critical year uh, for NATO after 1949 was in 1993-94, when for the first time uh, the United States in the first year of the Clinton administration began to think seriously about the expansion, or as we called it, the enlargement of NATO. Looking back, it may seem to you like an obvious choice. It had to be done. It was what history dictated at the moment, but that is not true. Uh, the opposition to NATO enlargement in the United States and among all the members of NATO in Western Europe was absolutely extraordinary. I joined the uh, policy planning staff of the Department of State in 1993, and a few of us there pushed it from in, inside the government. Outside the government, there were quite a few uh, supporters of this cause, Professor Brzezinski, uh, Henry Kissinger, Senator Luger uh, of Indiana, and in Europe, uh, it was Margaret Thatcher supported that. But you know what? There were very few of us at that time. It may seem like everybody wanted it. And I have to tell you quite candidly, uh, without mentioning a name, that now people who at that time strongly, vehemently opposed NATO enlargement, now they play themselves up as the greatest supporters. I, it so happens that I remember reading one ambassador's cables from a country I will not uh, I, I will not uh, mention here, and he used to be the strongest opponent of NATO enlargement, and uh, had uh, you know many good reasons. Uh, it will irritate the Russians. It will be too much for NATO to absorb all the new members, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, now his resume starts out by saying, referring to himself as the godfather of NATO enlargement. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that does happen. Uh, I can just see some of you are turning to each other. Who was this? Who could it be? <laughs> uh, and I, my, my, I will say uh, nothing about that. I think uh, that is when the first, uh, the first great historic movement forward uh, took place. And I'm certainly very happy that uh, I, was, I played a small uh, role. Uh, and this, I think, added uh, a new life uh, uh, new possibilities, new opportunities for NATO. At that time, uh, it's hard to remember, so many people were saying, well, what is NATO for? Uh, the Soviet Union had just collapsed. Uh, we don't need NATO anymore. And uh, I think ex enlargement ad added, uh, gave, gave NATO a new lease uh, on life. Uh, uh, Charles de Gaulle had said before uh, I'm not quoting it directly, but something like this, uh, had said before that once the Soviet Union ceases to exist, uh, NATO will be disbanded. Well, it didn't, and it has done a reasonably good job, I think. Every year you read, the, every month, you read articles saying the, uh, 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 NATO will disappear. There is no role for it. There are so many disagreements. The Europeans are, 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 want to do too little. The Americans want to do too much, and so on and so forth. And you know what? I don't think this is so. There are disagreements. Uh, an alliance is a lot like marriage. You have to work on it. There are disagreements, but you have to work on it. And, you know, mo lots of divorces, that's true. But uh, most of us survive. I've been married now for 35 years. And, but it's a lot of work, a lot of work. <laughs> it doesn't happen by itself. And so, uh, I mean, we don't uh, publicize uh, uh, this. And uh, I sh uh, Al, please take no notes. No, yeah, no notes on this one because I'll get into trouble. But in any case, I believe NATO has done a good job, maybe not an outstanding job, but I would give it an A-, maybe a B-plus if I want to be very uh, critical. 
Um, there have been no wars in the, uh, in the NATO area, in the Balkans yet. Yes, but uh, not there. No border incidents. Uh, the members have gotten along surprisingly well. I believe if there, ha I can't prove this, but if there had been no NATO, I believe some of the new members, those two, 10 new members, uh, might have behaved differently, might have be behaved similarly to countries in the Balkans. Uh, it is true that there are problems. Some of the new members are not so enthusiastic about NATO as they were 10 years ago or five years ago. Slovenia, uh, which is like acting pretty much like part of, 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 of Austria, you know, I'm not a diplomat, so I can talk about these countries the way I want to. Uh, they'll have to be careful over there. Uh, uh, but, you know, Slovenia is like Austria and looks to Austria and is neutral. And uh, probably today, if you took a vote in Slovenia, they, they probably would vote for neutrality. Even in my country, Hungary, the elite likes NATO. The people probably don't. I would say there is now a majority that, if, if given a chance, would go for, for neutrality. Uh, I think it's Slovakia is the same way. Maybe even in the Czech Republic. I don't know. Um, probably uh, Ambassador Polish will uh, uh, have a fight with me on that one. Um, the point is that today one of the problems there is that too many people take NATO for granted. And they don't recognize the extraordinary contributions to peace and stability uh, in the region. The paradox, which we did not see back in 93, 94 at all, is that when you sp uh, think of, of, uh, of instability, uh, there is a measure of instability within these countries, domestic instability, yes. But the international scene of, of Central and Eastern Europe is very promising indeed. Indeed, I think there is harmony there. Uh, inside, there is polarization, there is populism, there is some racism, there are real problems, and of course now, with the economies being what they are, these problems will get worse. Looking ahead, just, I don't know whether I have another two or three minutes perhaps, let me just say that despite, uh, despite uh, all this talk about how badly NATO is doing, I think it's going to be around. It's probably now the longest lasting alliance in history, and, uh, and I certainly hope and expect it uh, uh, to last. It's in reasonably good shape, uh, despite the disagreements that you read about, because unfortunately the press never says something is going well. They emphasize that which is unfortunate and, and perhaps, and perhaps uh, negative. The real issue is the gap between what the United States wants for, from uh, NATO and what the Europeans do. That, of course, has been around, though, uh, for decades. Uh, the United States would like NATO to be militarily more active and make greater contributions. Uh, the, the Europeans <clears throat> prefer diplomatic approaches, and they would like to see NATO militarily do less. I have the feeling, reading, reading the, uh, the tea leaves of the Obama administration, that this gap probably will, uh, if not close, but at least, uh, at least it will, uh, and it will not disappear, for sure, but I don't believe it will be as much a distraction as it has been. In other words, what I expect is that the United States will, uh, will, will demand less, expect less, and I certainly hope the Europeans will deliver more. And so somewhere in, in, in the middle, somewhere in between, the two sides might, uh, might meet. Um, as for more enlargement, uh, well, first let me just say something about the most important task for NATO today, and that's Afghanistan. This is a, the real issue. Aside from the European-American disagreements, uh, this is a really big issue. This is a NATO undertaking. We're contributing 17,000 more troops. I don't know what the Europeans will do. Uh, and the dilemma is truly uh, huge. On the one hand, <clears throat> on the one hand, if we uh, go in there, uh, it could turn into another Vietnam or Iraq for not just the United States, but for the NATO, all the NATO countries. Uh, 
so we say that we want a political solution and not a military solution. I welcome that, but I'd like to hear somebody say what that political solution will be. Does it mean that we will try to come to terms with the Taliban? Well, uh, if you know anything about the history of Taliban, that's a little hard for me to imagine what they would agree to that we in NATO uh, could also uh, uh, support. So, so there's a lot of, uh, of canned candor that's missing in these discussions, but I hope we will find the right solution. This country, for sure, does not need another Vietnam or another Iraq, and it is possible that, that Afghanistan may turn into one. On the other hand, not going in, given what we know about the terrorists there, given what we know about opium production for the whole world, I think is another impossibility. So luckily, I don't have to decide which way we go, but I hope we will have some wise people who will. As to more enlargement, uh, I, I may shock some of my friends, being such a fervent and strong supporter of NATO enlargement before, I think it's time to slow down. I think uh, Croatia will become a member, Albania. I think with Ukraine, which is the biggest issue, uh, my heart is broken, but my mind tells me that we'd better wait. 20 to 25 percent of the Ukrainian public wants a NATO membership. That's not good enough. Uh, the country is split. Uh, three, three different ways. Uh, they can't get their act together. I think it's time to wait. Uh, and the time will come, though, when that very important, critically important country could, uh, could join uh, NATO. So I think this is now, and I'll end on this, I think this is time for maintenance uh, uh, rather than some great historical steps that we began in 1993-94. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Ambassador Topic from the Republic of Poland. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to join this afternoon discussion. And uh, let me share with you some thoughts on, on this occasion. Uh, my first thought is why the enlargement of NATO happened despite this opposition which existed in many old NATO countries and, and but despite of this it happened actually this is what what Professor Gatti mentioned. Uh, Professor Gatti started with reference to book and let me also refer to Ron Asmus book Opening NATO's Door and uh, where he wrote that enlargement of NATO was not unavoidable, and the success of the efforts to enlarge NATO was not at all certain. Referring to this in his book to his Central and Eastern European friends, he stated that the idea to enlarge NATO was born in their minds and in hearts. It was they who kept faith alive and fought for this ambitious goal, even though the West thought that it was impossible. Ron Asmus concluded that these people were an aspiration to all and that in the West there were no reason, no real incentive to move the borders of the alliance to the East. Indeed, NATO enlargement was not certain. It happened, I believe, mainly as the result of thoughts and efforts of the leaders and diplomacy of the three Visegrad countries. After the Warsaw Pact collapse, they decided that the membership in NATO would be the best step forward towards connecting this region with the Western Europe as well as the best guarantee of security and development of these of the countries. In the West, as Professor Gatt mentioned, the, uh, the idea was initially met with reservations. These reservations were gradually removed mainly due to the determination and persistence of the leaders and diplomats of the Visegrad group countries. Also due to the very huge support of public opinion in our countries for joining NATO. 
In Poland, in 1997, the support was about 80% of public opinion was in favor of joining NATO. And was very important role was played the involvement of emigre communities of our countries in old NATO countries, and especially in the United States. Also, I believe the credibility of foreign policy conducted by Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary at that time played a very critical role. A part of efforts to join NATO, this policy was mainly directed at establishing new and constructive relations with their neighbors, and also for the first time in history at creating regional cooperation in Central Europe. And I believe this created confidence and convinced many politicians in the Western countries that new members can strengthen and not weaken NATO. The evolution in opinion of NATO member states was expressed in gradually adopting the slogan of building Europe, I quote, whole, free, and at peace. My second point is that the desire of our countries to join NATO was not an attempt to reverse or to shift alliances and to replace Warsaw Treaty with NATO. The first reason behind our efforts was to overcome the division of Europe. And in fact, discussion concerning enlargement, in essence, was not about alliances in the future. It was mainly discussion on the future of Europe. Our countries wanted to overcome not only the post-Yalta order, but also historical division of Europe the division that existed in the minds of politicians and public opinion of the West for, I would say, centuries. Real Europe, for many of them, ended in Germany. Further on to the East, there was the other Europe, as a rule identified with the spheres of, in of influence of Germany or Russia. It was particularly felt after the Second World War. Central and Eastern Europe was excluded from the great post-war projects. This part of Europe was not allowed to join Marshall Plan. We were great losers in the period of rehabilitation of European post-war economy. We did not have a chance to join the great design of Atlantic Alliance and European integration. And I believe that NATO enlargement has become, in fact, one of the most promising and prominent steps towards the overcoming this not only post-war, but historical division of Europe. My third point is that NATO enlargement led also to the deep transformation and adjustment of the alliance to the post-Cold War realities. After enlargement, and I would say to a certain, uh, to, to, to certain extent because of the enlargement, a kind of a, what I call NATO system has been built around this organization. It comprises today not only the NATO, as the alliance of the 26 countries, but also the Euro-Atlantic Partnership Council and the Partnership for Peace Program, encompassing additional 23 countries and many from Central Asia. It includes also the mechanism of special relations with Russia, with Ukraine, with countries that participate in so-called Mediterranean dialogue, and there are also special relations uh, in the form of high-level meetings, participation in NATO exercises with so-called contact countries like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Republic of Korea. The NATO system has become, I believe, a fundamental instrument 
not only for building international stability, but also in organizing broad political and military cooperation, both transatlantic, but also covering a part of Asia. And I believe that this NATO system contains great potential and constitutes an indispensable element of the security arrangements, not only in our continent, but also in the global context, and must be kept and reinforced. And I hope today decision of NATO countries will revitalize the NATO-Russia Council. My fourth point is that NATO, and I completely agree with Professor Gatti, continues to play a crucial role in the security of, of Europe and not only of Europe. And this is, I would say, very strongly felt in Poland, but I understand also in the Czech Republic and Hungary. Apart from its role of, of the effective defense alliance, NATO constitutes also a community of states sharing the same values and beliefs in democracy and human rights. Sometimes we are discussing about so-called leak of democracies, but in fact, NATO is already such a leak of democracies. And we strongly believe that the debate on the new strategic concept we will s that we, we will start later this year will contribute to NATO future role to the benefit not only of the member states, but the whole Euro-Atlantic security system. And it seems, to, it seems to me that it's a good sign that the first overseas trip of President Obama is exactly to Europe and including NATO summit, which will celebrate the 60th anniversary of NATO. Concluding, it seems to me that today, while reflecting upon the meaning of the invitation of Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary to join NATO 10 years ago, we can say the following. Undoubtedly, it was a historical decision. It was a significant step towards overcoming the division of Europe, as well as important sign for other European countries and other European organization. And it assisted in the future our efforts to join European Union. Membership in the Alliance also strengthened democracy in Central Europe and democratic control of military. It helped to modernize military forces of our countries. It helped maintain security of our countries and for the first time, we have become the US allies. And we entered politically and military integrated group of peaceful and democratic states. From the alliance perspective, its enlargement in 1999 was a significant part of its transformation. It increased the safety or safety zone in Europe it strengthened transatlantic ties. It increased the union of similarly minded countries in facing new security threats. In conclusion, from Poland's, I believe Czech's and Hungarian views, as also from the Atlantic Alliance perspective, the admission of our three countries must be assessed as highly positive development. And even one can ask the following question. What would have happened if Central European countries had remained outside the alliance? If they remained a kind of a gray zone and a region of constant rivalries for influence, as, a, as well as a region of weakened, weakened security and stability? Our road to European integration would have been much longer and harder. And I am afraid also the situation in Europe would be very different. 
So looking from this perspective, the maturity and division of political leaders at the time of Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary should be recognized. We must also appreciate their determination and cooperation in realizing the common goal, as well as credibility of the foreign policy, which made the membership in NATO a reality. Finally, we must recognize also the vision and the courage of old members of NATO. Despite first reservation to invite our countries to NATO, and it was, I believe, a really very good decision. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And our uh, third speaker is Ambassador Paulus from the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, thank you very much for having me here on this special occasion. It's an uh, advantage and disadvantage at the same time to speak as the last because Many things have been said, and obviously uh, previous speakers inspire you, so I'm now afraid how I can squeeze my talk to uh, this 10, 15, 12 minutes. Obviously, I like uh, very much fights with Charles Getty. It's my uh, favorite intellectual exercise, but I'm afraid today uh, maybe our differences will be not as big as uh, maybe could be under different uh, circumstances. First of all, uh, it's a good to be reminded here Today, as we speak, uh, there was a ministerial meeting uh, of NATO in Brussels with uh, Secretary of State uh, Clinton for the first time participating. And obviously, it would be interesting to see what was on the agenda of that meeting. I don't have time for that. Certainly, Afghanistan was one of the uh, top points. But now we are to celebrate and commemorate the anniversary, 10th anniversary of our entry to NATO. Anniversaries are a good occasion to celebrate, but also to try to understand the differences of uh, perspectives. Certainly we uh, had some uh, state of mind in the moment when we were entering uh, the NATO, and now we are looking uh, uh, at that situation with, uh, I wouldn't say not more wisdom, but at least with more experience uh, 10, years, uh, 10 years later. Very briefly, uh, if uh, this uh, uh, anniversary is to be celebrated, I would need to go even to darker uh, past, uh, strolling through the streets of Prague with Charles Getty bef before 1989 and thinking, talking, but uh, s uh, sadly not about uh, any time soon membership of Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary in NATO. And then right after the Velvet Revolution, the first months of 1990, I remember actually I was most likely the first Czech diplomat uh, who uh, and uh, who was uh, present uh, at the headquarters of NATO in Brussels with a very fresh diplomatic passport. And I remember it was the time of London summit of NATO that uh, invented the first concept. It was called uh, NATO states were asked to establish diplomatic liaison with uh, former communist countries. And then the process that started onwards, uh, frankly speaking, in that moment, uh, uh, the NATO's enlargement was not in circulation of ideas. There were other proposals. Uh, CSCE or OSCE was very, uh, very uh, popular in these days, and a Russian or Soviet proposal then was to merge, to do kind of merge between Warsaw Pact and NATO. Uh, so I think that if we want to understand the dynamics of the process in NATO, we also need to remember what, was, what happened with Warsaw Pact, what kind of decision were taken. A little later, uh, 1992, 1993, and onwards. I agree with Charles Getty, uh, no fights, uh, that uh, uh, important decisions were taken, I would say, a NATO summit in uh, January of 1994 that invented the Partnership for Peace as a, a kind of working formula for rapprochement. But we also should remember, and it's very important, that... Uh, in the months before, uh, uh, Russian, already not Soviet, but Russian diplomats, Minister Kozerev, came with a, a new concept that, again, had not been before in circulation, so-called near abroad, uh, which uh, wanted to define uh, the Russian area of just strategic interest in their neighborhood. And in this uh, uh, moment, uh, 
I can think about one very important article that was published. Ron Asmus was certainly one of uh, its authors, together with Joseph Kugler and Steve Larabi, which basically defined, I would say, three dimensions of the problem. And these three dimensions are with us till today. Uh, it, will, it discussed the uh, transformation of the system in Europe uh, in three uh, dimensions. First, EU first. Could it be possible that uh, European Union would be enlarged and drive all other transformations, or NATO first? And the third was very interesting options called Russia firsters, those who would be uh, thinking first about the Russian perspective. I think that we still have these three here, EU, NATO, and uh, Russian perspective on the process. I think that empirical answer to uh, our question has been given. NATO came first in the first wave. Interestingly enough, there was a second wave of the NATO enlargement in thousand, uh, 2004, and uh, these seven countries, they went almost all together, both NATO and uh, EU. And it seems to me that if we want to speak now about the third wave, uh, obviously Croatia and uh, Albania, they are in a different situation, but if you want to look more to the east, I think now maybe the order can be reversed. That uh, talking to diplomats from Moldova, uh, Ukraine, Transcaucasian republics, I think that uh, EU uh, is maybe a safer option for that moment, but not excluding, uh, maybe at some point later, uh, uh, the uh, enlargement of NATO as well. Uh, so this would be my, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this would be my remark to that. So we really need to see the dynamism of the process in context. And there was a third concept that appeared uh, on the way to our membership in NATO, so-called out-of-area actions. I think it was uh, Senator Luger who invented this one. Uh, he, it was a beautiful slogan, out-of-area or out-of-action. He wanted simply to say that not only uh, actions of NATO, defensive action, uh, according to, uh, based on the Article 5 of Washington Treaty, but some other activities of NATO needs to be considered. And also it needs to be said, just for the record, that when we entered in March of 1999, and I remember this moment, it was really uh, like a dream for me. I was participating in this flag-raising ceremony in Brussels, seeing out of sudden our flag together with Polish and Hungarian in a very good society of flags. Uh, and, but what happened two weeks later was, if you remember well, uh, this decision uh, uh, to go to Kosovo and to bomb Belgrade and other cities of Yugoslavia or Serbia. And uh, so we were immediately exposed to very difficult domestic political process. I, and I remember how difficult it was, especially in, uh, in the Czech Republic with uh, then existing governmental uh, constellation. So uh, obviously part of that process is, I would say, also reconsideration and change task NATO has set for itself. Not only defense of territory, but also out of area activities, which means obviously also dramatic change and transformation of NATO armies. What must be also emphasized is absolute importance of NATO enlargement for the processes of transformation of societies that uh, were considered and eventually became members based on this uh, study on NATO enlargement uh, commissioned by NATO itself, was published in 1995, it says very clearly that members of NATO need to be democratic, respect human rights, have a civilian control of military, and you name it. There was a whole bunch of, bunch of things that uh, were mentioned. So I think that uh, this was maybe one of the most important elements of the NATO enlargement, that it was not only enlargement of military alliance, it was not only about military activities. It was a genuine part of process of transformation or democratization of the societies. It was strong motivation for all these countries really to join, to return, and to comply with the rules that uh, were recognized or that were defined in, uh, let's say, this text I've mentioned. And what I have to say here, uh, and maybe uh, most audience are not Americans, I don't know, but we need really to thank the United States. 
because, uh, frankly speaking, if we were only to rely on the decisions made by uh, European members of NATO, I think the process would have been much more complicated. Uh, it was, I would say, American pressure and American concept of transformation. I see the ambassador here. I think that you would uh, certainly agree with that. And here, and maybe uh, you are going to kill me now, uh, I uh, see here a very significant element of continuity of the U.S. foreign policy, either Democrats or Republicans. If you want to find a way in which uh, the Clinton administration and Bush administration uh, uh, made compatible steps, it was in this process of NATO enlargement, because uh, the, NATO, uh, the second wave of NATO enlargement was in the hands of the uh, Bush's administration and uh, followed the same principles, same philosophy, same rules of transition. So I think that this was extremely important step and obviously we now can endlessly debate what's going to happen now. Uh, this third wave, if you want to talk about that, uh, I need to say for the record, before the first uh, wave of NATO enlargement, Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary, there was a zero wave. Uh, unification of Germany as a prerequisite for this process because then East Germany became a NATO territory out of uh, sudden and obviously it was maybe the crucial moment in the whole process. So going back to this third wave, obviously uh, what needs to be emphasized is not when but uh, Article 10 on Washington Treaty uh, on open door policy, that there is a no, and it was repeated today by uh, Secretary Albright, that uh, 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 European countries have a right uh, to apply for membership in NATO if they meet certain conditions, and that there is a no external uh, decision maker that can influence that process from the outside. It's always a sensitive formula for uh, defining good relationships with other major players like the Russian Federation. But I think that it's very important that uh, uh, this conditionality still, uh, that, it is, that the open door policy of NATO is emphasized. And it is again a message for countries like Georgia and others. Uh, obviously they need to make uh, their own decisions and sort out their own political problems but they should not be left behind uh, beyond any new iron or whatever kind of carton that and exist. So I think that it, is, uh, it, it again is something what makes NATO uh, extremely important alliance. Uh, last thing I would uh, like to say is new tasks. Obviously, uh, I said uh, uh, Washington Treaty uh, and uh, uh, the activities connected with that, for the record again, for the first time, this was uh, invoked after 9-11 by the European members of NATO, and then I think the American response was uh, uh, what it was. Uh, it was a collective effort uh, to see the attack on the United States as an attack on all, uh, on whole mem on all members of NATO. Very important. And uh, then tasks uh, co connected with out of area activities with uh, Afghanistan and with obviously new threats that now are very different from the past. Uh, I think that for all countries like the Czech Republic, Poland and Hungary, this has been a tremendous school, a uh, tremendous challenge and obviously we are uh, tremendously grateful for what happened. Obviously a very difficult task is and responsibility because I think membership in NATO is first responsibility and being uh, ability to deliver. Uh, responsibility to other members of NATO and also courage of politicians not to be populistic at home and be ready to stand sometime for causes that are not going to bring you more votes as what we see today. So uh, let me thank you for uh, this opportunity. There are certain reasons to celebrate but it is a great challenge for us to keep NATO alive and let's hope that it will be alive for 26 and maybe for more in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think our panelists have uh, been spoken directly from the heart on their feelings with regard to the, the alliance in 10 years after the uh, second expansion. 
and uh, what almost 60 years after the forming of the of the alliance itself, um, tremendous examples of what that has done uh, for security in Europe and transatlantic cooperation and um, collaboration within the uh, European community and, and, and quite frankly throughout the world. Uh, interesting, we do certainly appreciate the support uh, to our country uh, following 9-11 and uh, in operations out of, uh, out of the NATO area uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, I'm going to open the floor to questions, but um, to get things started, I'd like to ask one, and uh, it kind of pivots off of uh, something that uh, Professor Gotti had to say with regard to the U.S. and NATO relationship uh, of demanding less, expecting uh, less, and perhaps NATO delivering more. Um, my question would be, uh, here we find ourselves in a very stressful, situ stressful world. Um, not just because of the operations in Afghanistan, but also because of the world economic situation. So I guess um, uh, talking about that relationship between the U.S. and NATO countries, uh, how do we see um, the alliance being tested as we go forward here in the, in the coming years? And I'll start with Professor Gotti. We do have mics here. I don't know what we're supposed to do. What are we supposed to do? This? Well, I already referred to some of these uh, problems uh, ahead, and there may well be some disagreements here uh, on, the, on the panel. Uh, um, but I'm rather hopeful that NATO will work out the basic issue at hand, which is uh, uh, the gap between what the United States would like to see NATO do and what many European countries uh, uh, would like to do. I'm certainly not referring to Poland uh, and the uh, Czech Republic, uh, or for that matter, Hungary. They have, they have done, uh, uh, they have made tremendous contributions, and in some ways, I think they are closer to the many issues. They are closer to the American expectations than they are to the the West European, uh, particularly the German uh, expectations. Um, I just like to say, before I say another word or two about Afghanistan, perhaps, that the, uh, the, the idea of further enlargement uh, has to be a rational uh, decision. You have to take into account not just what some of us feel uh, about the right of European countries. I do agree very much with Ambassador Polish on that. I think if Ukraine wants to join NATO, and if it... Uh, if it has the qualities that NATO insists on, I see no reason uh, why we should not go ahead just because the Russians don't like the idea. It's not their organization, it's ours. And they lost the Cold War. Uh, and uh, and I, think, uh, I think they should learn the lessons from that so that they would focus on what they can do in the world. I think we should not celebrate their, uh, their defeat. It's a humiliated country. It has enormous difficulties. It has a population loss of about 750,000 people a year. Um, and uh, if you travel in, in, uh, in, in Russia outside of Moscow and you try to drive there, try some of those roads to understand that Russia remains today a country whose strength is in nuclear weapons and nothing else, uh, especially given the the, the declining uh, price of, of energy. So under these circumstances, we should not celebrate, and we should seek cooperation, but they have no veto. And this, this was an issue back in 93, 94. They have no veto on what NATO would do. I personally believe Ukraine is not ready uh, uh, to join, but I hope the time will come my, in my lifetime when it will be. Uh, Georgia is another case. I'm not much of an expert on that. Uh, um, for sure, uh, I think probably the same thing for different reasons because there the population really wants to join NATO unless, unlike the Euro Ukrainians, but I'm not sure the political system is sufficiently stable uh, and ready to accept some of the limitations NATO membership uh, suggests or implies. Now, um, 
uh, about Afghanistan, that's the biggest challenge today. I don't know if I can really go beyond the, describing the dilemma. I'm a professor, not an advocate. I'm an analyst, not an advocate. Uh, so uh, I, I just want you to understand that, and I want our, our colleagues here to understand America's dilemmas. That's something I do understand very well. Uh, we are facing uh, an extraordinary economic crisis. Uh, in this country and in the world, to undertake the kind of involvement uh, comparable to Iraq or Vietnam under these circumstances is something we have to think about. I'm not against it. I have not quite made up my mind. I know that if we don't go in there and, and make a political deal with the Taliban and, and, and gain some military uh, success, I think that would be awful. Uh, if we did go in and couldn't win, uh, I don't want to see American for This is, a, if I may say, an audience of my, uh, my generation uh, here. You remember that helicopter at the top of the American embassy in uh, Vietnam. I don't want that to happen again to my country here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Ambassador Topic. Well, it seems to me in the future development of NATO, three factors are of uh, main importance. First, the future. We can hear you in the back. Yeah. First, the relationship between uh, United States and European countries, and it seems to me we are entering now the period of better understanding and much closer relationship between new. American administration and European countries, or European NATO countries. And it is, as I mentioned, it is very much appreciated that the first overseas trip of President Obama is to NATO summit meeting. There are some uh, rumors, and I, I, I hope it will be implemented in practice about France going back to the NATO structure. So in general is a positive, I would say, movement in the relationship between United States and European allies. Second element is the question of practical cooperation in security field between NATO and European Union. And in fact, this is the field where much more must be done. At this moment, it seems to me uh, what is very important is because there is no special mechanism of cooperation in security matters between European Union and NATO countries, uh, and NATO. But, but it, it seems to me uh, now we have a lot of practical, pragmatic cooperation, including in Afghanistan. And of course, uh, I, I agree that maybe the, the European countries' contribution to Afghanistan could be much uh, larger. And it seems to me these efforts are being undertaken. Uh, but what must be taken into account that still many, and especially probably new NATO countries, they don't have any tradition of expeditionary forces. And for instance, in case of, of Poland, I would say, in because of our history and because of our location between two great powers, always the main mission of our forces was to defend borders of our country. But now our participation both in Iraq and in Afghanistan is growing very much. At this moment we have about 1,600 soldiers fighting in Afghanistan and probably it will increase. And the third element which is very important for the future of NATO are relationship between NATO and the neighborhood, and especially the future of relations and cooperation, especially on common challenges, or common security challenges between NATO countries and Russia. Of course, it is too early to say how it will look like in the future, but it seems to me there are some first symptoms of positive developments, and I hope it will go in this direction. So, thank you.
Pastor Paul. Uh, I will try to be uh, very brief. Uh, I think that I already said uh, there are three uh, uh, parts of uh, the question EU, NATO, and Russian Federation. Uh, there is a very relevant question for both EU and NATO, and I'll put it in more general terms, where does Europe end? What is, uh, do we have a, a final idea uh, uh, who should belong to the system and uh, with whom we should uh, have a, a friendly uh, but relationship as a, as a with big partner? It seems to me intuitively uh, that EU and NATO uh, should certainly uh, occupy similar uh, same territory. We have a question of integration of Turkey into uh, the European Union, which is a traditional state of NATO, and uh, we can imagine other scenarios with some members, uh, some countries being uh, first integrated to European Union and still with uh, being part of the puzzle, relationship between EU and NATO as a two institutions, two organizations. I think it's extremely important that the European Union uh, uh, solves its own problem and uh, defines or redefines the relationship between NATO and uh, uh, European Union. And I think that if it uh, happens, then obviously uh, the relationship or negotiations with the third and very important partner, which means Russian Federation, would be easier. And I see it, uh, if you uh, can imagine the map, uh, Transcaucasia, that's a traditional uh, border of Europe. Even ancient historians uh, put the end of Europe somewhere uh, there to this territory. And this is, uh, as some uh, you know, people in Washington like to say in my days there, uh, it's interesting that this is the territory through which old Silk Road uh, used to go, uh, connecting Europe and uh, countries out there in the east. Now we don't have Silk Roads anymore, but we have uh, pipelines. Uh, so it's another uh, uh, important trajectory which is there, traditionally dividing the zones of influence of Ottoman Empire and Russian Empire. So I think that if we find a way how to cooperate uh, in pragmatic matters, and energy security is certainly one of them, and uh, meet the uh, expectation of small nations, small countries, like Georgians that are very sensitive to be pushed by uh, big ones, uh, this would be, uh, I would say, quite a uh, uh, good project uh, for the future. And very last thing, we are in New York, which means the United Nations. And here, as we speak, a very important topic is the uh, future of peacekeeping operations and uh, relationship between universal organization like the United Nations and regional bodies, regional arrangements. And NATO and the European Union are certainly uh, also can be categorized as uh, regional arrangements. Obviously, NATO has also some uh, experience uh, acting on behalf of the United Nations. Obviously, uh, respect for uh, the principles of charter are, I would say, built into Washington Treaty itself. Uh, so I think this is another important relationship. Uh, out of area actions, I think, need to be seen uh, also from this New York perspective and uh, then uh, found, uh, find their place uh, uh, with other regional organizations they are, uh, that are out there. We have some, have some time to take some questions. Well, uh, thank you very much. My name is Patrick Hayford. I work at the UN on Africa. Um, specifically on this question of out-of-area action, um, I know NATO has no mandate relating to Africa, but we are all witness to what's happening on this question of piracy off the coast of, of, of Somalia. And there are some observers who um, feel that um, we are going to progressively be confronted with other problems of fragile states in some parts of Africa essentially falling apart. And what is the, uh, this is addressed to Professor Gatti in particular, how is NATO likely to uh, react to 
the unfolding of situations such as this problem of piracy uh, of the coast of Somalia, which become threats, real threats to international commerce or international peace and security. Again, I ask this knowing very well that NATO really has, it's not supposed to have anything to do with Africa, but what if things get really bad in certain areas? What is NATO's role likely to be? Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't know the, the answer uh, to your question, but I will make one uh, brief comment, and that is uh, NATO, uh, back in the case of Yugoslavia that I believe uh, Ambassador and, and Professor Palos uh, uh, mentioned, uh, NATO had to decide under what auspices and under what legitimacy it could act there. It could not get Security Council uh, support. Uh, mainly because of Moscow. And so NATO then decided that if all NATO members agree, that was sufficient legitimacy to act in Yugoslavia. As somebody who cares about the United Nations, as I do, uh, I had a hard time swallowing that, but I did, and I supported uh, what we did, in, and I think very successfully what NATO did there. I have uh, a, a real serious doubts that NATO under present circumstances and under uh, economic pressures of the type that we are all familiar with will undertake quite such uh, 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 actions. That doesn't mean that one or two countries there, well, I'm thinking of France actually and possibly the United States, might not, uh, might not um, do something on their own, but I don't believe it will be under NATO auspices, but I would defer to my, my friends on the panel who uh, work at the UN, which I do not do. Uh, I'm not uh, prepared in detail, but what I know about, uh, first of all, uh, uh, piracy is uh, maybe one of the oldest crimes uh, you know, uh, under international law uh, in the open sea. And uh, so uh, uh, it certainly needs a specific arrangement. There is a question then of uh, jurisdiction and uh, responsibility. There's operation uh, of the United Nations, AMISOM, uh, uh, there, which basically is a traditional peacekeeping operation, uh, and these operations were not used to uh, operate on the seas. Uh, they are, it's not a, I think the United Nations is not very strong in naval operations, so there is an operation of European uh, uh, union there, and some European countries that are uh, obviously uh, having at their disposal uh, you know, capabilities are operating there, but uh, uh, this would be a great, I think, challenge for NATO. I think it would be doable. I can speak for uh, the NATO uh, commanders, but uh, it's not on at that uh, moment. Uh, obviously, uh, Africa is uh, a continent uh, which basically uh, is a territory of many peacekeeping operations today. And there, there, there was a European operation there in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now there is a transition in, uh, in Chad, uh, Minurkat. Uh, and uh, we can name other uh, situations in which we see the common context of the European and uh, UN operation. Actually, in Afghanistan, there is a... Uh, 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 UNAMA, uh, the operation of the United Nations, working closely with the coalition uh, operation Enduring Freedom and ISAF. So uh, we have here these combinations today, and I think that uh, all uh, participants need to be creative, flexible, and uh, uh, follow uh, the basic objective of that particular operation. Could I be next? If I could add to this uh, one very short comment. It seems to me that the cooperation between, uh, between uh, United Nations and regional, uh, and regional organization is, uh, uh, is growing. And in fact, in Africa, we have cooperation between United Nations and African Union, and we have also cooperation between United Nations and European Union. And it seems to me if the Security Council address NATO countries with such a request, probably it would be considered very carefully. I don't know what would be the answer 
but it, soon, it seems to me that NATO from its own initiative maybe will not be able to take that such a step. But if there is a request from the Security Council, probably the response uh, would be positive. Thank you. Very briefly, I'm addressing my question to uh, Professor Gatti from the ASC. I'm Andrew Harold. I'm, I'm probably least qualified to ask this question, but I'd like to. I can't hear you too well. Can okay. you use the I, microphone? I'm Andrew Harold. I'm probably least qualified to ask this question, Mr. Gatti, but President Johnson, when he was more clairvoyant about what was about to be done in, in Vietnam or Indochina, <coughs> said, when asked by Galbraith what situation are we in, he said in his text and fashion, uh, he said, well, there's no light because we don't know where the tunnel is. Uh, Galbraith had asked him, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? And I like to use that metaphoric construct to guide us into the present with respect to NATO and with respect to Afghanistan. All of the non-military analysts say it's a sinkhole. It doesn't even have the configuration of a tunnel. Now, good. You can be myopic and say NATO will be able to do it. Uh, I just want to inject this kind of mentality. Uh, this this uh, certainty about NATO being almighty is, uh, in my opinion, a uh, very uh, risky um, analysis. So you may comment, but you don't have to, but I want to make that comment. <laughs> Thank you for, for the question. Is this one? Yes. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I don't think I can go much beyond what I said on the subject. Uh, I, I am sympathetic and, uh, uh, to your view, and I, I know you are concerned. Many other Americans, I am concerned. Uh, my question is not whether we should win there. The question is whether it's winnable. Uh, but uh, before I reach your conclusion, which I have not yet reached, uh, uh, you know, you have to consider the alternative, uh, that there is a country there that uh, trains terrorists, dangerous terrorists, and it is a country that is a major source, perhaps the major source, uh, for uh, some of the worst drugs that reach uh, the Western world, including the United States. So. There is something to be done. The question is, and I am not enough of an expert to, to tell, the question is whether it can be achieved. That is the question, unfortunately, that was not asked uh, and investigated and debated sufficiently before Iraq, and that is the question that was not sufficiently debated before Vietnam. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to uh, return this to our host here. As, um some of our panelists have to have to depart, but I think a few of them will be here for the uh, period afterwards. So, please. Well, just very briefly, I just want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank our moderator, Jim Tapp. I want to thank you for coming. But most of all, I would like to thank the Foreign Policy Association for working with uh, the Consulate General of the Czech Republic and Poland as, and Hungary in organizing this evening. And I say, and as I said before, please join us for some food and drink next door. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.